The story of Covington, a 200-year journey, is presented by First NBC Bank, your homegrown community bank servicing the financial needs on the north and south shores of the River Region. With additional support from St. Tammany Parish Hospital, the City of Covington, Covington Brew House, Champagne Beverage Company, and Mealy Printing. The rivers led them here. The Chifuncta and Bogafalaya rivers cradled a quiet land, nearly covered with tall pines and dense forests. Few had seen this land, but those who ventured across the lake or into the pine canopied woods found the inlets and rivers and found their futures here. They would clear homesteads, raise families, build a community. They would carve lifetimes and generations out of this land. But before that would happen, before the first permanent settlers, six flags would fly over this ground, traded back and forth, one in wars far away and in deals between nations. Spanish, French, British, Spanish again. And for a few brief weeks in late 1810, a new separate nation, the new Republic of West Florida. That lasted a month and a half before Covington officially became a part of the United States. Serious settlement began with a Spanish land grant given to a New Orleans merchant named Jacques Drew in 1803. He tried, but couldn't turn it into a town. A fascinating, entrepreneurially minded young man named John Warden Collins uh, ultimately purchased the Drew Track. And he is the one who founded Covington effectively July 4th, uh, 1813. Collins, who owned a store on Magazine Street in New Orleans, paid $2,300 for the land, followed his boat captain brother across the lake, and started laying out streets and divisions. He named his favorite, what would become downtown, after himself, using the title Saint to make it sound better, the division of St. John. The whole town he named after his Scottish grandfather. He called it Wharton. The city would last centuries, the name would not. Within three years, the state legislature would change that name and break his heart. The War of 1812 was raging when the town began, and Collins served under General David Bannister Morgan on the West Bank. They uh, evidently had some kind of conflict because when the war was over, and the town of Wharton had been established, and it sought a charter from the state legislature. David Bannister Morgan was the representative in the legislature, and he convinced the legislature to change the name from Wharton to Covington to honor General Leonard Covington. In March of 1816, the town name was changed to Covington to honor that hero of the War of 1812. It was too much for Collins, who within a year fell ill, moved back to New Orleans, and died. He was 29 years old. His body was returned to Covington and buried at the corner of Kirkland and Columbia. Granite now marks his final resting place, but after 200 years, Collins' remains are lost in the earth. Even infrared sensors have been unable to find a gravesite here. Still, sifting through the past uncovers the footprints of those who first came and those who followed after. 
those who made a home in this place full of resources and resourcefulness. were the invitation here, the way in and out, and the cradle they created provided the natural boundaries for a thriving new city. You remember Louisiana was a brand new state at that time. There was a lot of optimism, a lot of looking forward on the part of these founding families that, that came from back east. They were interested in building a new community, a new way of life. They wanted business opportunities and they wanted uh, economic and intellectual freedom. The boats carried them as far north as what became known as the Columbia Street Landing. It's hard for us to believe that these large boats could come to that spot because today there are times when you could walk across the river. But that was a port. It, was, it brought so many of our settlers that settled the community. From here, goods and produce from the north could find a way across the lake to market in the big city of New Orleans. Covington's port had drawn cotton from as far away as 100 miles north of Covington. Ox teams lined up on Columbia Street waiting for their turn at the landing to unload their cotton for transshipment to New Orleans. Ox lots were the original founder's idea. Unique early civil planning that helped promote commerce right from the beginning and eventually helped put the area on the National Register of Historic Places. The places to park oxen, now places to park cars. 39 blocks with 39 public squares in the middle. People would bring uh, goods from their small farms and they would bring it to downtown Covington and they would bring it by oxen and the oxen would then be housed in these public squares in the center of each square. That's how the name Oxlots came about. Early on, settlers recognized that profit was growing all around them. The tall, thick stands of long leaf yellow pine, lumber companies and sawmills set up, logs were floated down the river to transport and sell, or burned and heated to make tar and pitch and charcoal. From the ground, they gathered clay, turned it into bricks, used to build here and sell elsewhere. One of the founding fathers, Judge Jesse Jones, used mules walking on each side of the river to move his brick business along. It was a time for invention and experimentation. Who knew what would catch on? Bottled water being collected and sold here for health benefits, that goes back to 1853. A Covingtonian named William Bagley, who was a mariner and a mercantile owner in Covington, got involved with bottling and selling water from the Abita Spring. Mulberry trees seemed important for a while as a few entrepreneurs tried their hand at raising silkworms. Small vineyards gave it a go. Tanning animal hides brought in some cash. There are references for quantities of oak bark because the oak bark was stripped from the trees, soaked in water, it released tannin, and the tannic acid was used to cure animal hides. At one point, tongue oil and turpentine put a lot of men to work. The early and mid-1800s were busy times of growth and survival, but two arrivals would change the economic direction. In 1854, the train came, but not through here. A railroad was built from Jackson to New Orleans on the west side of the lake. Transport so much faster, it dried up much of Covington's boat-based economy. But the worst was still to come. War. In the years between 1861 and 1865, even survival seemed in jeopardy. When New Orleans fell to the Union, trade across the lake was outlawed. It was a crushing blow to an economy, still relying on shipping goods to and from New Orleans. Conditions became almost unbearable. 
Because of the poverty, immediately after the war, many people moved. They left. There was no way to make a living. There was no way to survive here. And within a couple of years after the war, the population was down to about 300 people. But there were still trees and clay. And once trade was open again, demand slowly revived the economy and the population. Extra, extra, read all about it. The St. Tammany farmer began printing in 1874, at the end of Reconstruction, promoting farming and real estate and the Democratic ticket. The newspaper, its mission expanded since then, is still a fixture in downtown. In 1876, H.J. Smith opened a store on Columbia Street, where it still stands, a thriving business and a museum of history. This was the first Walmart. This was the first um, place where people could come and get everything they needed. Plus, uh, they, they could tell them how to do it, how to plant something and grow it, or how to butcher an animal, or how to, how to fix something. And it's, that's all part of the, the heritage or the business or the things that were handed down through the years. The train finally made its way to Covington in 1888, bringing with it a logging industry that would help heal the city, but not without leaving scars of its own. The railroad came across the river, and, uh, and after that, they cut every pine tree in the area and uh, clear-cut it. And you can see some old pictures of Covington at the Columbia Street Landing, and it's barren. There are no trees. Uh, and then, of course, after that, they started planting a, a, a different species, a loblolly and a slash pine, uh, which is what you see today. Still, there were enough trees and beauty to sing a siren song to tourists. They came by rail and by steamer to get away, to get a breath of fresh air, air that was cleverly marketed into the ozone belt. A doctor's description published in the Chicago Herald in 1897 Put it this way. The air is filled with the balsamic odor. There is a constant liberation of ozone and no germ disease of any kind has ever gained foothold there. Because of a relatively low death rate and the fact that the area was spared from the many yellow fever epidemics, the U.S. government proclaimed Covington the healthiest spot in the United States. People flocked to the area to find the rest cure, what some called the Great Southern Sanitarium. When we think of sanitarium, we think of a psychiatric hospital. Well, back then it was just a place for rest, recuperation, good nutrition, where you could recuperate from all the illnesses and the infections that were going around because this was a big time for yellow fever, malaria, TB, things that were uncontrollable. We didn't have antibiotics in. A visit, it seemed, could cure anything, according to the advertisements. The natural springs are highly medicinal and especially helpful in the healing of all kidney troubles, liver diseases, dyspepsia, chronic diarrhea, constipation, nervousness, general debility, and almost any unnatural condition. Some locals found it all a bit too healthy. And in the 1920s, Adrian Swartz introduced a resolution uh, in the, the council to stop talking about the good health of this area because we don't want any more of those sick people coming here. By the 1940s, medical advancements and antibiotics cured various illnesses, but killed the demand for many of the ozone belt sanitariums. The Southern Hotel made its appearance in 1907, boasting hot water, carpets, and electric lights. It survived for a half century before it became a drugstore, and then many years later, a courthouse annex. Toogies, a tavern inside the hotel building, stayed, quite possibly making the combo the only courthouse building in the country with a bar on site. Formal banking came to Covington just before the turn of the century. The Bank of Covington started doing business inside a store. Others followed that success commerce and competition were on the rise. On uh, Columbia Street in a two block span, there were four grocery stores, one a vegetable stand, and two meat markets, just on, on Columbia Street when I was a child. Businesses changed with the economy. There was the oil bust in the 1980s, 
and retail sales struggled in the 90s. Bad times and good. Some of the old faded away, making way for the new, and some, some, will make their way home again. home changed over the centuries. Those innovations in getting people from here to there changed more than just travel. They changed the speed of life. When settlers first arrived, the transportation was slower and didn't make much noise. Boats slipped silently up the rivers. The trot of horses kept quiet with fallen pine straw. In these low areas, there were hardwood trees and in the upper areas there were the longleaf pine and the longleaf pine had a high canopy and a real nice uh, understory that was open so people were able to travel uh, without a lot of brambles and briars. But they needed roads and streets and help. Now the roads were simply dirt tracks between the squares that had been laid out uh, in the town survey. And so maintaining the roads was a continuing problem. So rather than tax people in terms of money, males 21 years of age and over were required to work so many hours a month to maintain the roads. It was called road duty. In 1832, a visiting newspaper writer didn't quite get the concept. Amused by the whole town of Covington working on the roads, all things in common. Curious law this, don't understand it. But the townspeople understood. The work was self-protection. Hogs love to root in the ground. So they would get in those bare streets and they would root around and leave holes. And somebody riding a horse Coming on, if the horse stepped in one of those holes, he might break his leg, he might throw the rider off. It was a serious issue. Boats, schooners, and then steamers kept commerce alive on the rivers. Navigation meant dredging. Bridge building was written about over and over in the paper. The big bridge over the Bogafalaya at Covington was carried away by the high water last Saturday assisted by the hundreds of saw logs that lodged against it. The loss of this important bridge is a public calamity. We've heard a number of our citizens express themselves as being tired of building bridges to be knocked down by saw logs. The promise to build a new strong bridge across the Bogafalaya helped lure the railroad, something Covington desperately needed to keep up. May of 1888. The train rolled into town for the first time. It would change life in Covington, a faster, easier way to transport goods and people. The trip across the lake would take less than an hour and a half and cost just a dollar. The city suddenly found itself in a position of having to slow things down. There were posted speed limits on the streets of downtown Covington. Horses and buggies and wagons being pulled by horses and oxen could not exceed 10 miles per hour on the streets. Trains were restricted to six miles per hour in town, particularly at all crossings. No buggy or wagon parking on Gibson Street at the depot. It was the first no stopping law in the city. While trains captured the attention and eye of commuters, it wasn't long before heads were turning to see what else was coming down the road. It might have been a rough ride at first, but the automobile brought independence, mobility, status, and accidents. The first recorded car wreck in Covington was in 1910, as more and more people decided the horseless carriage was the way to go. One of the first car dealers in town was Deed Smith. He sold three different types of cars, the Brush, the Flanders, the Jackson. In 1911, he decided he was going to go to Detroit and get 
of Flanders. It was a 30 horsepower automobile. He drove it back here. It took him 11 days, 103 gallons of gasoline, and it was 1,431 miles. People were on the go with a need for speed. An organization formed, and they met at the Southern Hotel uh, on Boston Street, and they came up with a plan to dredge the bottom of the lake and create a series of islands and hook the islands together with bridges. This was in the 1920s. But the state decided to fund a shorter five-mile bridge across the eastern side of the lake instead. So the Covington plan died in the 20s, but the idea did not. The idea was nurtured into the post-World War II era. And in 1956, the longest bridge in the world shortened the drive and stretched the possibilities. Well, for those of us over here, it was just marvelous. And in an hour's time or a little more, you could be in New Orleans and shopping on Canal Street. But of course, none of us really thought ahead and realized that if we could go there, they could come here. And they did. The 40 minute trip across the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway would cost a dollar. For the first time, it became reasonable to work on the South Shore and live over here. And so there was an, um, an influx of new families, which meant new ideas, new viewpoints, and I think that's been really healthy. The new traffic demanded new roads and new views. 190, they built the, uh, the four lane at 190, and I think it completed it in 1971, and things changed. Uh, before that, uh, the, te the trees touched from here to Mandeville, and there was a four-way stop. It was one four-way stop between here and Mandeville. Uh, 1971 saw that change, and we started seeing fast foods come in, and suburban sprawl. The city of Covington, with its river boundaries, was able to control the sprawl that followed, protecting its small town identity. They all knew each other in the beginning. The first town election took place in a home in 1817. They would form the town, make laws, and oversee just about everything. The earliest Covington town charters, several members of the town council were appointed to act as constables for the town as part of their duties of, of town councilmen to start patrolling for safety and sanitation. They were determined to be a proper town and everyone was expected to pitch in. From the earliest days, Covington property owners were required to dig and maintain drainage ditches in front of their own pieces of property that was along local streets. That was not provided by the town of Covington. Individuals had to take care of it. There were slaves here, but not in the numbers seen in other areas with plantations and endless fields. Slaves worked in homes, a bit of agriculture and in industry, logging, brick making. Court records show some were able to escape those bonds by buying their own freedom. One case, the Maples and the Broxtons, two families, owners and slaves, who came together from North Carolina. They journeyed here together, but they had a vision for something better than that arrangement. When they arrived here, the Broxton family started working for wages in the town of Covington, saving their money, and eventually purchased their own freedom from the Maples family. Eventually, they owned a bakery, a laundry, and their own home. And we know that Mr. Broxton was one of the people who built the first courthouse in 1832 in downtown Covington. He lived to help build the seat of justice in his new community. By 1860, sounds of war moved across the country. Talk in the South of leaving the Union. The people of St. Tammany Parish cast their ballot against secession. They were outvoted. 
A new flag was raised over the region, the national flag of Louisiana. That lasted just over a month. And in March of 1861, the Confederate flag would fly over Covington. In 1865, once again, under a United States flag, citizens were asked to sign an oath, swearing they had never advocated treason or voted for secession. The people of Covington were left to rebuild their economy and their lives. And I think the year was um, 1888, 1889. And my grandfather, Emil Frederick, ran for alderman against a Mr. A.G. McCormick, and it was a tie. And so Mr. McCormick and my grandfather flipped a silver dollar to see who would hold that post. Her grandfather lost, but was eventually elected anyway. About that time, the people of Covington decided it was high time to have a town hall. The mayor issued a challenge to the women in this article, dated August 1889. One half of the amount necessary to build this hall is available. And we know that if the ladies, to whom such a word as fail is not known, will take the matter of entertainments in charge, the other half will soon be on hand. The women came through and building began. The women would also step up to raise the money for the first library in town. They helped bring a hospital to Covington and they took on cleaning up the town, pushing for laws to get loitering men back to work and working girls off the streets. Laws that helped keep the marshal busy. A police report from the farmer in the late 1880s. There was a dispute on Florida Street last Wednesday night between a couple of members of our female population. It was a plain case of assault and battery with intent to commit much noise with the mouth. Fine, $4. There were laws against throwing a baseball on or near Columbia Street. No spitting in public, no swimming in the nude. Even problems with indoor privies were dumped on the desk of the marshal. And in 1897, there was concern that some of the new indoor water closets were not being properly maintained and sanitized. So the town marshal at that time was given the job by the mayor of inspecting all the water closets in the town of Covington. By 1956, there were three law enforcement officers in the city. They were no longer responsible for bathroom inspections. In the 1960s, the Bogafalaya might not have been able to pass inspection. In the 60s, the river water became polluted, and the city fathers felt that they really didn't want to encourage swimming. So the landing, which goes down a hill, was um, allowed to grow up into shrubs and trees and virtually closed. In 1987, elected as the first woman on the council, Clanton knew the city had no money to save what she called the birthplace of Covington. But they came from far and wide. They cleared the street. They used backhoes and other things of their own equipment at times. The people came through, and the birthplace was reborn. A $64 million investment built after the turn of the 21st century kept Covington as the parish seat. Of all the old parish courthouses, only two survived. This 1818 structure still stands across the Bogafalaya in Claiborne Hill. And this, built downtown in 1956, now serves as the parish emergency operations center. Today, the Justice Center brings in a constant flow of court business and jury pools to Covington, the center of activity in a growing, educated, enduring parish. Formed in the midst of war, Covington was a fledgling town during the War of 1812, almost too small for General Andrew Jackson to take notice as he passed through on his way to the Battle of New Orleans. His engineer, however, included a mention in his diary of the trip. 
Wharton is a small new town containing but a few ordinary buildings, situated at the head of navigation on the bank of the creek. The war pulled men away, but it didn't come to the small town. It would be the same a half century later when the Civil War broke out in the country. Encounters with Union troops would be brief. And they landed uh, at what now the boat launch at the foot of 4th, 4th Street, and they had to land there because there was a ship sunk across the channel. And they marched up to Covington, marched through the streets showing the flag, and uh, marched back down again and got on the boat and left. That was Covington's involvement in the war. Although the battles were not in the streets, the terrors and troubles were. Covington had a hard time during the war. There was a lot of deprivation here. You couldn't move goods in and out, couldn't take them down to New Orleans to sell or bring things back. Uh, people were hungry, had a hard time getting foodstuffs, let alone medicine if needed, or any kind of care here. What Confederate soldiers did not requisition, Union soldiers passing through took. Deserters made off of the rest. A newspaper editor in 1863, the paper was called The Covington Wanderer, and he wrote a piece which concluded, it is not safe for a man to have one day's provisions ahead and let it be known. And by the end of the war, many of the boys had gone off and been killed. Uh, the population was women and old men. And so from 1865 to 1875, there was just nothing here but poverty and despair. Three Confederate gunboats never made it out of the Bogafalaya. Captured in New Orleans, the boats were on their way to Mobile. But a Union officer decided just to sink them instead. Some say you can still catch a glimpse of the ship's skeleton if the river is low. Family stories of Yankee sightings are still around, too. One day, my grandfather and all of his buddy friends, boys, went to the Columbia Street landing and they were skinny dipping. And all of a sudden, they heard this thunderous noise. So they all looked up the hill to see what that was. It was a Yankee cavalry riding down the hill. And the boys were so frightened that they all ran home without their clothes. The wars to come would all be fought far away, though the heartache would be close. Letters from hometown boys written to their families were printed in the paper, May 1918. Well, here's me, 25 years old today, thousands of miles away from home, and my birthday cake way back at home. Yesterday, had the pleasure and honor of giving the command fire to the gun crews of 10 trench mortars. We fired 670 bombs or more and helped pave the way for our infantry. Those wars now marked with memorials. Grief turned to granite in honor of those who didn't get to come home and those who fought for this small town in this big country. Through the years, battles of a different kind would ravage and rally Covington. Even in the beginning, they knew fire could quickly turn to fear. In 1819, the first Fire Prevention Act required buckets of sand to be conspicuously hung in all public places. As the town grew, they needed a better plan. An article in 1889 showed concern even as the brand new town hall was being built. It is a fact that Covington has no means of extinguishing a fire, if we should be so unfortunate as to have one. The council should attend to this matter as soon as our town hall is finished and paid for. Within 10 years, the new town hall burned to the ground. The flames spread and before it was over, much of the town was gone too. In 1906, another serious fire. And again, the downtown was nearly wiped out. A woman's letter to her niece describes what she saw. The Pythian Hall was burning and there was great danger of Babington's store and the depot catching. A car had been sent to Greenlaw's mill for dynamite and as soon as it came, they blew up the house next to Dr. Tolson's office. 
which checked the fire on that side of the street. A few years later, the new fire department ordered 25 fire plugs for the city. When the next blaze broke out, they watched five houses burn. The hoses didn't fit the plugs. My dad talked about experience of a fire right next door. They took tin and nailed a two by four to the back of the tin and used that as a heat shield and got between the two buildings and they were wetting down the side of this building with horse-drawn water wagons. And Dad said that he could remember the sap balling out of the longleaf pine siding boards. It got so hot. But they did save the building and keep it from catching on fire. At one point, the town installed water tanks under the streets to help battle blazes. Some are still there, paved over and forgotten. Eventually, firefighters were able to tap directly into the city's new waterworks system. In 1993, the people of Covington voted to fund full-time firefighters. The department currently holds one of the best response records in the state, answering more than 1,400 calls each year. At times, too much water became the problem. The rivers would spill into the roads and buildings and pour from the skies, whipped by furious winds. But the storm that hit the hardest, the storm that left much of the South Shore and lakefront regions underwater, tore this area apart with wind. On August the 29th, 2005, Katrina roared into town. Luckily, we didn't have flooding, but the, uh, the pine trees, every, every two or three pine trees in the neighborhoods were toppled over. Uh, what, what I first saw were, were trees on the ground as I walked the streets. They were like toothpicks laying across the streets. When Katrina left, the people came, some to help, some to stay, finding refuge in a place that had passed the test of a hundred year storm. Even so, one of the area's greatest resources and treasures took on the shadow of an enemy. After every storm, uh, there's a big move to cut every pine tree in town. Uh, Katrina was pretty significant in the fact that it, it really has impacted for a long time people's uh, ideas about trees. People plant more oaks now to replace the trees lost in the storm, other native trees as well. And while there are fewer of them, pine trees still stand and sway above, a reminder of how those tall trees protected and provided for those who came before. Even when it was mostly trees and dirt trails, the early settlers of Covington leaned heavily on their faith. Houses of worship would rise soon after settlers built their own homes. A Presbyterian minister arriving in the area in 1823 seemed both unimpressed and yet surprised by the town and its people. There is nothing worthy of notice in the village of Covington, except that, contrary to the common practice, they have a burial ground substantially and handsomely enclosed, and that, equally out of the fashion of the country, the people were united and punctual in their attention to religious worship. It is no wonder then that by 1850, many of the major religious denominations were set up in Covington, including a church for free people of color. It was very, uh, a, a very critical thing for someone to establish a church for free blacks, for example. Slaves were not permitted to attend these churches for fear that they might hear something that would make them rebellious. At Christ Episcopal Church, built in 1847, there was a separate slave gallery in the back, accessible by ladder through the old bell tower. The original chapel still stands. They got that, the land through uh, an auction. Undoubtedly, there was some kind of sale where the property was put up for auction, and they bought the property for $50. They built the church 
for $1,350 back in those days. Inside, it looks as it did long ago, with the original pews that were rented by families, assuring them of a seat at service. Pew doors to stop the draft on those cold mornings. It is the oldest building in Covington still in public use. Churches have always been a part of the fabric of the community. Baptists are said to be among the first settlers. Presbyterians and Methodist circuit riders were making the rounds in the early 1800s. Catholics came with priests and teachers. They all built, grew, and spread out. St. Peter's has had three churches. The First Baptist Church has had several locations. One of them now is home to Covington City Hall. And they're all community-based, you know, they're, they're within a neighborhood and they're part of the, the fabric of the community. We have a real a section, uh, Jefferson Avenue, where all of the churches or most of the churches have located over time. So it's really nice to have those institutions, you know, schools and churches and then government buildings. All makes this a real complete city. The first school opened in 1820. 17 years later, several of the original settlers, including businessman Jesse Jones, expanded the opportunity. He was a very well-educated man, and he saw the importance of women in having an education. So he founded the Covington Female Academy. That school changed hands and names a few times until a group of Benedictine sisters purchased the land and built a new school, St. Scholastica Academy. Opened in 1903, boarding students would pay $100 for a five-month session. That was room, board, tuition, and laundry. Many schools would come and go in the 1800s for white and black students. The typical school year lasted about three months. At the turn of the century, Dixon Academy opened on Janky Avenue, taking students for $5 to $15 a term. The Benedictine monks bought the school in 1911 and called it St. Paul's College until they decided to concentrate their efforts on their seminary. Christian brothers took over and called it St. Paul's School. The first public high school got its start in 1913. Covington High School changed buildings, locations, and merged schools over the years. The early 1900s would also bring a longer school year. Most would go to a full nine-month schedule. After selling St. Paul's, the Benedictine monks built St. Joseph's Seminary and Abbey just outside of Covington in those first few years of the new century. One monk, though, continued the education mission in town. The one big thing that he did is to, is to establish a school for black children here in the, in the 40s. Um, and he connected with uh, the Sisters of the Holy Family out of New Orleans, an order of nuns, of, of, of black nuns. And they staffed this school and ran the school. A door-to-door -door fundraising campaign in the African-American community helped pay for the Rosenwald School before desegregation. By bringing the people together to work for this cause. Um, here you find the culture of the community. The schools were the gathering places. Here in Covington, there were pageants, dances, programs, and the people turn out to see their children. In the struggle for continuing education, Reverend Peter Atkins was one of the leaders who stepped up to break barriers. He was just a voice. Uh, and a trumpeter for the community. He cared a lot about his community to the point that when kids would go off to college, him and his church got together, and it wasn't much. It was just what they could do, uh, but they sent them money uh, for college. Shane School, which now houses the school administration offices on Jefferson Avenue, used to be the Covington Grammar School. It was there that a barefoot boy named Lee Harvey Oswald walked into a first grade class. He didn't finish the school year. In 1959, the school served as a temporary courthouse when Governor Earl Long fought to keep himself out of a mental hospital. While the PTA sold lemonade and cookies outside, the governor stood before a judge who presided from a seat under the basketball goal.
There are 10 schools in Covington today, mixed in with churches and neighborhoods and shops. A community needs not just your retail shops and sales tax revenue to survive. You need the, the, you need the fabric of, of education, religion, the cultural aspects to make the total community. And that's what brings people to Covington, and that's what keeps people here in our city. It's a love that kept families here for 200 years now. There's a bit of whimsy that goes with the story of the naming of the town, whimsy and whiskey. This legend from the family of Jesse Jones. He said to be sitting around having a drink with the boys and they're discussing what they're going to call the town since obviously they're not going to call it Wharton anymore. And, and he says, boys, he says, we've gotten so much pleasure out of this substance. And he's got his glass in his hand. Why don't we name it Covington? Because Covington, Kentucky is what was stamped on the side of the bow if the whiskey came down in. That's their story. If it happened, or if it's hogwash, the legend survived. <coughs> From day one, hogs played a part in daily life. Hogs and cattle would routinely run through the streets of Covington uh, and graze, drink, spend their day and eventually go home at night. Now, I think the cattle were a little more reliable for wanting to go home. The hogs, on the other hand, had the wild run of the place. Everyone had to have a hog because there was no garbage pickup. So the hogs were garbage disposal units on four legs. From 1819 till 1937, the city council passed laws trying to rein in the grazing. The year they were finally successful, they passed an ordinance making everyone cut their grass. General stores would give people a fighting chance at survival, getting in those necessities, especially after the Civil War. Times were hard and people were desperate. So most citizens were armed. It became routine for people to carry firearms during the day during the course of a normal business day. They thought very little of, of pulling a loaded gun and, and shooting off the gun, starting up street fights. It was a true Wild West atmosphere, and women were involved as well as men. Mardi Gras came to Covington in 1879 with costumes and parading through the streets. For those who couldn't make it across the lake, it was magical. And soon enough, even those who could go chose to stay for the fun. Oil-fired streetlights went up in 1879, the first in the parish. Well, it's a little surprise I have for you, Mary. It's a telephone. A telephone? The telephone rang in 1900. The single line was in a store. Within five months, there were 79 subscribers. Electricity was on a year after that, thanks to the St. Tammany Ice and Manufacturing Company. The city was growing up fast. The moving picture shows captivated the crowds at the beginning of the 1900s, and soon the downtown was crowded with movie houses. The Parkview, the Majestic, the Deluxe, and the popular star, a place to meet up with friends or the place to meet the whole town, the loudspeakers blaring patriotic music in celebration of the end of World War II. One theater operator, Charles Sidney Furman, often encouraged live talent to go along with the show. He had talent night very frequently, and anybody that played the harmonica, sang, danced, recited, whatever. They could come for talent night and get this. They could even win five dollars. Big money. His legacy lives on in the Furman Auditorium at the Greater Covington Center. Some big names in jazz and early rock and roll 
made stops in the area known as the West 30s. Right here in Covington, Louisiana, uh, there was a, a, a music uh, circuit called the Chitlin Circuit. We all know names like Ray Charles. We, most of us know Bobby Blue Band. Uh, most of us know Otis Reddy, Fats Domino, B.B. King, guys like this. This is where they had their chance to perform before they were allowed into other places. Life in Covington always seemed to have style. There were always groups of people who did music, who did poems, who did theater. Uh, in 1850 census, there was one guy who was making his living as an artist. Can you imagine that? Nobody can do that today, really. <laughs> but he was doing it. Those who love the stage found a common bond in community theater as the popular playmakers got it started in the 1950s. We found a barn, and it was just like a Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movie. It was, we've found a barn, we've made a theater, we're putting on a play, come see. People still come to see the shows in the Playmakers Barn just outside of Covington. Art of all kinds found a home here for the past half century encouraged by the St. Tammany Art Association. I remember at one time somebody called us the Soho on the Bogafalaya, where we uh, really put a lot of emphasis on art. Today, galleries dot the downtown canvas and art shows fill the calendar. It seems this easy pace has always been prized here. Certainly there was work to be done, but life did not need to fly by. The whistle on the water tower would alert the town to dangers or fires. Eventually, it would also be the sound of lunch. We had a siren that would go off in downtown at noon every workday. It would sound at noon to signify the beginning of the lunch hour. It would sound again at one. Time to go back to work, except maybe on Wednesdays when a lot of folks would just take the rest of the afternoon off. My dad would have been 10 years old. He told me his job was to listen to the radio. When Babe Ruth would come to bat, he would run up and down the street, tell all the business owners Babe Ruth was coming to bat. They would all shut the doors on the stores, come run down, listen to him bat, and they'd go back to work when he finished bat. In the 1930s and 40s, a day at the beach. Cherubin Beach might cost a quarter, or Jim's free beach was free. The white sand and swaying trees inviting on a hot summer day. Getting groceries was a bit more convenient then. Not a lot of selection, but they came right to the house. People used to call in their order when they wanted to get groceries. They didn't have to come to the store. They'd just get on the phone and they'd call up and say, I want a, a loaf of bread and I want a pound of red beans, and then we would deliver it to their home. Over the years, the stores grew and neighborhoods grew up, but still close enough to walk and close knit enough to care. The causeway brought new neighbors, and sometimes the label of suburbia. Coventonians don't like to be called a suburb of New Orleans, and not too crazy about the term bedroom community either, because that sort of implies suburb. Um, but, um, we are, I mean, to be real honest, we are, but we'd rather not be called that. And I think we have a distinct identity. We have a traditional town, you know, our downtown is uh, a good scale. It's a human scale and it's accessible from all the neighborhoods by walking, by biking or a short drive. So, uh, and you can do everything. It's a walkable town, a different pace in a place apart through two centuries kept small and special. A half century ago, Covington celebrated its 150th birthday with a parade, looking back, not knowing what was to come, how the world would change. Covington, still delighting in its past, today celebrates the present.
I think there's always been a real pride in the community and a sense that um, we can kind of have it all. We can have the small town atmosphere, but we can still have, you know, an emphasis on the arts. We, we are uh, the seat of parish government. We have a major hospital. We've always believed it, and now, to some extent, other people are realizing it as well. And there still is that sense of the person next door, where in many other places, that's not the case. You have trumpeters in this community, people who are determined to keep this community close-knit and keep this community working together with one another. The families who make up the heart of Covington. The festivals and celebrations of life. The comfortable fit of the people and the place. The paths from other times are still paths traced today. History is alive and nurtured and visible in the familiar places and spaces, well used and well loved. It just has a, a charm about it, even after all these years with everything that has happened, all the things that have brought so many people, so many automobiles and so many big stores and things of that sort that we never expected to have in Covington. Uh, it still has that charm of being a, a small community. You feel it when you walk in there. This is something that feels like that's where you ought to be. It's a, it's a, it's a beckoning sort of vibe. You get the feeling there have been people there a long, long time and happy. I think people who live here, even when they meet strangers, feel that they're meeting a longtime friend. And I think in the, in, the, in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, I think our families are going to grow, our friendships are going to grow. Our boundaries may not grow, but that's okay. Moments melt into memories, and memories into history. The past is a familiar friend here, seen every day walking alongside as Covington keeps pace with the present and faces the future. The story of Covington, a 200-year journey, is presented by First NBC Bank, your homegrown community bank servicing the financial needs on the north and south shores of the River Region, with additional support from St. Tammany Parish Hospital, the City of Covington, Covington Brew House, Champagne Beverage Company, and Mealy Printing. To order a DVD copy of The Story of Covington, A 200-Year Journey, for only $29.99, visit WLAE.com or call 504-830-3717. Help support WLAE and our great lineup of programs that are local and entertaining.